touch him. It's nothing coming out. No, you jamming. <laughs> what happened to? Uh, it's okay. Amen, amen. Come on and take your seats, please, if you would. Nothing like fellowship in the name of Jesus. It's amazing how in 60 or 90 seconds you can just change your whole mood, change the whole atmosphere by just greeting somebody with uh, the spirit of love. It can make your whole day. You know, sometimes you can just be walking through your everyday walk and and meet somebody at the gas station or the drugstore and, and have a momentary conversation with them. But something about that individual, the Christ that's in that person, will ignite with the Christ that's in you, and it will change your entire day. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? The miracle working power of Jesus the Christ as it relates to moving in the spirit of his love. Go with me into the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 121, and we want to look at verse 1. A very familiar text on this morning. Most people have probably heard this once or several times throughout your life, even if you haven't read it. It may be familiar to you. When you have it, say amen. Amen. And the scripture reads, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help comes from. But the interesting thing about this, if you look at the end of the sentence, there's a punctuation mark that most people have never really noticed before. It's a question mark there. What's cometh my help? It makes you wonder if, in fact, the word of God here is actually saying that maybe God is not coming to your rescue, or maybe he only comes to your rescue if it's something that's far off, or maybe he only comes to help you out if it's a certain type of miracle. Sometimes we get into relationship and fellowship with God, and we we, we, it's like entering into a marriage. It is a marriage of sorts. But sometimes, if you have a marriage after a while, after years or even decades, you, you get into a place of, of comfort. You get into a place to where you have relaxed with your significant other. And some of the charge and some of the excitement that you had when you, when you first started courting or during the engagement or even the first couple of years of marriage, sometimes... The thrill that you had may give way to just relaxing in the ordinary, everyday things that come with life. Nothing wrong with that. There's something to be said about slow burning love as it t takes the test of time. But sometimes as we shift into that mindset in our marriages, we may even joke and say, you remember when we used to walk down the beach and hold hands? And remember when we would get up in the middle of the night and go get an ice cream cone? Or you remember how you used to chase me around the house and tickle me? And you, you may laugh about the nostalgia of the whole thing, and you may even have a fond memory, but you don't feel motivated to, to, to invoke that type of, uh, of passion anymore. After all, it's a different type of relationship. You've, you've matured now. You don't have to deal with that folly anymore. Do you? 
And you may tell your significant other, oh, it's when we were young, and maybe, you know, <laughs> I remember this when we were, we didn't know any better, and we would go and share a fish sandwich because we didn't have a whole lot of money, and those were the best times, and now we're in a place of comfort, and we don't need to do that anymore. Am I talking about your marriage, or am I talking about your relationship with Christ? We have walked with Jesus for a long time, some of us, and, and we know him, and, and, and we're in, in communion with him. It's a marriage of sorts. And the thrill that we used to have, the excitement about the miracles of Christ, we know that he can do anything, and we know he's awesome and amazing, and we know that we should praise him, but it's, it's almost like going through the motions. Oh, well, it's Wednesday night, so we're, we're having meatloaf. Amen. Amen. Nothing wrong with meatloaf. But maybe you, sometimes you might want to still get up in the middle of the night and go get a fish sandwich Amen. or an ice cream cone or whatever you used to do Amen. when the thrill was still there. Is he the God of the hills? Question mark. Is he only a God that can perform a miracle when we need a miracle, a certain type of miracle? Is he the God that can perform a financial miracle in my life, but he, he can't perform a, a, a healing? Or can he perform a healing and not a financial miracle? Or can he bless my job but not my child? Or bless my child and not my job? Or bless me to be blessed without a job? Or... Bless me with a new house and not a new car. Bless me with wisdom but not understanding. Bless me with peace but not bless me with love. Or however you want to configure it. In essence, is he a God that can only bless you in a certain way? Is the thrill so far gone that you can't imagine that you can be completely fulfilled Amen. and have the comfort of a long-standing relationship but still have the thrill and the excitement that comes with being deeply in love. Amen. Ironically, we say, oh, we love Jesus. And we do. But the way we think of our love for our Lord and Savior is more like the love of a 40-year marriage without having had the honeymoon period. We don't even think of it in, in those terms. We think of it as something that's really uh, dutiful, really that we should do. It's best for us, and we go do it because we have to. It's almost like eating Brussels sprouts before you eat your steak. You, you have to get through the green veggies so you can enjoy the main course. Oh, I must be the only one that thinks of it this way. Isn't it ironic that the driving force of the entire universe, the, the creator of everything, the CEO of the entire existence is something that we think of as dutiful. We embrace it because we have to do it. Same way we cut our grass. Man, we love our lawns to look good, but I, I, don't, I don't think any of you actually loves cutting the grass. You like the finished product, you like the result, you know it's good, it's good to do, but you don't wake up and say, oh, it's Saturday, I get to cut the grass. You don't think of it that way. And it's almost the same way that we approach our relationship with Christ. Is he the God of the hills? Do I only think of him in one category or one set of categories. Has he placed me in a situation to where I've been believing him for a miracle for a long time or that he would change my circumstances for a long time? And it doesn't seem to be happening, but we still love him anyway because it's dutiful. We're supposed to. We have to. We're too far into it to back up. We're in the marriage too deep to, to, to separate. We couldn't even think of a divorce. 
but we married him. Oh, I didn't know he had stinky feet when I married him, but I married him. I didn't know that she snores when I married her, but I married her. So in a marriage, sometimes you just accept some things about your spouse, and this is the one you're going to take the journey with, so you, you learn to grow together. And that's how we think of Christ in human form. There's some things about Christ that are not perf perfect, so I'll just go along with the fact that he's not going to necessarily bless me in this area, but he's blessed me over here. And when I really need a miracle, I can look to the hills whence cometh my help, and I can call on him. But sometimes, if I'm really honest with myself, the things that I really want over here don't seem to be happening. How many people know what I'm talking about? But I go along with it because the marriage overall is very good and, and he's been good to me and I don't want to complain because I don't have this. So really, I'll just keep him as a God that's over here in the hills. Is he only a God of the hills? Is he only a God when you need a miracle? Is he only a God when you, when you think of it as reverence? Agape love. Go with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 20 and verse 1. 1 Kings, chapter 20, verse 1. I'm going to try to cover this text quickly. This is the story of King Ahab and King Ben-Hadib. King Ben-Hadib had a, a consortium of other kings. Think of it kind of like the United Nations. There were 32 kings in total. It was an, an incredible force, an incredible military force, especially for that period in history. There were 127,000 soldiers, a lot, for that period in history. King Hadid, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces together, the 32 kings, and with him were horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and made war against it. And he sent a messenger to the city of Ahab, the king of Israel, which would be King Ahab. Thus says ben Hadid, all your silver and all your gold are mine Taking all your money, in other words. Not only am I taking all your money, but I'm also taking your best wives and your kids. All your money. All of your immediate family. Taking it. Because I can. King Ahab knew, knew that he was greatly outmatched, greatly outnumbered. It would have been a massacre if he stood up to King Ben-Hadid. So what he said was, my Lord, O king, just as you say, all that I have is yours. I don't want to go to war with you. I don't think there's no way we could win. We would get massacred if we did. I don't want to, to, to even take this on for a battle for myself or for my people. I know we will die. So really, I've been forced into a corner to give up everything. And because it would be such a loss, outwardly and inwardly, I'm not going to fight it. I believe most of us have been assigned or attached to a scenario, a situation, a person, a job, a kid, a spouse, that has made us feel utterly hopeless on the inside. Maybe a health issue, maybe a mindset, to where the attachment is so visceral, so deep, until you feel like you have no choice but to go along with the fact that that issue is so draining that it has made you do things that you never would have done under ordinary circumstances. Amen. Amen. Many sleepless nights, many tears, many prayers, and it continues to pull on you and pull out of you until really you don't have any choice, you feel 
except to allow it to continue to happen. It's taken almost everything out of you. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? And it's rather difficult because you are mature Christians, most of you, and, and you know who God is, and you know the promises of God. You know his miracle-working power. You've witnessed it for a long time, and, and you know that you can look to the hills, what's coming to your help, but you don't understand why God has allowed you to be in this particular situation for so long. And what's more, you know the situation that you've been attached to was assigned by him. How can it be God? This is where King Ahab was. You've taken my money, you've taken my, way, my family, you've taken, in a sense, my dignity inwardly, but because of who I am, I'm going to stand strong, and on the outside, it still looks like I have the dignity that I started with. After King Ahab agreed to give him his silver, his gold, his wives, and his children, you know what King Ben-Hadid did? He went on to say, not only that, but I'm also going to send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they're going to search your house and the houses of your servants and everything that you find pleasing, they're going to take. Everything that you would find joy with. It's going to be taken. Everything that you, uh, that's endeared to you is going to be snatched away. The one thing about the enemy, the one thing about Satan that you can always count on, he is efficient at his job and he's not going to stop until you make him stop. Amen. Whatever the attack is, whether it's a physical ailment, whether it's financial, whether it's related to family, career, whatever. The enemy will not stop until you invoke the power of God in you and make him stop. King Ahab said, you know what? I agreed, and I still agree. That you can take my silver, you can take my gold, you can take my best wives and the children. But this last thing, this last thing that you have said you want to take from me and my servants, this thing I cannot do. I can't do it. I can't take it anymore. I'm drawing a line in the sand right here. Oh, you ought to praise them. I believe most of you on this morning have reached a place in your life, in your walk, where you've, you've really had no choice but to draw a line in the sand. The attack from the enemy on your health, your finances, your job, your car, your dog, your cat, whatever it's been, has been so long and so consuming until you've had no choice but to face the odds and draw a line in the sand no matter what may come. Come what may. For God I stand and for God I die. And that is what has been invoked in you right now. How many people know what I'm speaking of on this morning? He had no choice. He had no choice. Why, God, would you allow me to be backed into a corner? To where I have no choice. Why would you allow the attack or whatever I'm facing to be so consuming until I have no choice but to face the impossible odds? Mm -hmm. King Benedict had 127,000 soldiers. King Ahab had 7,000. The odds, the, the comparison, there was no comparison. It would be sudden death. Your situation, by you taking a stand, looks like the odds would be utterly impossible. Lately, many people have told me about cancer diagnoses. Okay, that's in our society often, that's a, that's a death sentence. 
unless you invoke the miracle working power of God. Lots of people lately are losing their jobs. No income. That's a death sentence, at least to the lifestyle you're used to. Unless you invoke the miracle working power of God. Talk to some people that are having trouble with marriages after years and decades. A death sentence in that area. Unless you invoke the miracle working power of God. Here's the part to catch, though. Sometimes we will limit God. We will put God in categories in our own mindset. We will get into a comfort zone with God for what he can do, what he will do, what he will do for us, what he's done in the past. Some people are gifted in areas of faith and don't have much faith in other areas. Some people have a gift for financial prosperity, but don't have the gift to speak healing. Some people have the gift for healing, but don't have any money. Some people have a beautiful marriage, but no kids. Some people have kids and no marriage. Some people have a beautiful car and no house. Some people have a house and no car, or however you want to configure it. Most of us, at some point, are looking for something that is missing to complete the big picture of what abundance looks like to us. What he's saying to you on this morning is if you can believe him for this part, why can't you believe him for that part? He's not only a God of the hills. Is he only a God of the hills of healing, but not the valley of prosperity? Is he only a God of, 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 of blessed Children, but not the, not the God of a blessed marriage? Right, right, right. Only the God for you to have love in your heart and spread joy among people, but, but you can't have a decent career? Amen, amen. Or vice versa, you have a great job, but you don't have any love or any friends? Right. Or you have all of these things and your kids don't speak to you? Or your spouse doesn't speak to you? Or whatever seems to be missing because of the category that we put God into. Is he a God of the hills only? Is it a marriage of convenience only? He's been good to us. I don't want to divorce him. You know, I, the thrill is not there. Well, maybe if you found the thrill, created the thrill, or asked him how to have the thrill in your relationship with him, all of these other areas would open up for you effortlessly. Amen. You see, part of the journey is sometimes you're going to face trials and tribulations. Part of the journey is he has to show you situations that seem impossible. He's a God of all possibilities, so in order for you to see how awesome he is, he has to put you in a scenario that looks impossible at first. We already know this. You already know he can overcome anything. But what you need to ask yourself is, God, how can I fall in love with you even more in the situation that looks opposite to me right now? You see, God, I don't want it to be just meatloaf on Wednesday night because I'm married to you. I don't want to just have business as usual because that's what I'm supposed to do. I want to be in love with the situation. I want to have joy in my life. I want to have some zest. I want the thrill back in my relationship with you even more than it's ever been before. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? You see, if I have been assigned to this thing, if I've already decided that I'm going to walk it all the way out, if I'm already committed for the rest of my life, shouldn't I be getting some enjoyment out of it? Should I? As I get older, does that mean that I shouldn't have the fun that I had when I was younger? So it, it, is fun and excitement and, and, and joy and happiness only limited to, to when I'm young? And dumb? <laughs> no, 
Not saying that young people are dumb, but we do get smarter as we get older. <laughs> Thank God for diplomacy. <laughs> but I mean, stop and think about it. The things that we used to do, the, the things that we used to be so much fun, we now consider for the most part foolishness. But then because I'm wiser, does that mean I sacrifice enjoyment? Excitement? Am I limited to only meatloaf on Thursday? Nothing wrong with meatloaf. I like, I like meatloaf. But I still want to, I want to get excited about some things. And if, if, my, if my relationship with God takes me into higher places of wisdom and understanding, which means that my behavior changed from how I used to be, well, shouldn't I have at least the same level of excitement about life, if not more? Amen. Amen. Yes! He made everything. Didn't he make fun and excitement? Can I have that in my life? Well, what's stopping me? What's stopping you? You. Most of us put God in a box. We take him out when we need him. We dutifully get up and pray on our knees. Something we have to wrestle. Have you ever noticed? You lay in your bed and think about it for 15 minutes before you actually get up and pray. Oh. Right? And then when you do it, it's because you should do it. You don't always want to do it. Then after you do it, you feel better. Coming to church, I have to be here, but how many of you struggle with it sometimes? You don't struggle when it was time to go to the club. Right? When you were younger, and you know, not that you would do that now. Do you understand my point? With the things that seem like folly, we, we, we ran to them. But as we go higher and deeper in God, it's almost like we're fighting ourselves. Well, if that's what we're supposed to do, and he's the miracle-working God of everything, God, can't you touch me to where I'm excited about it? Is he just the God of the hills? Let me finish the text. So... King Ahab drew a line in the sand. He said, this, this thing I can't do. I can't carry it any further. You've taken enough out of me. I have no more to give. I have no choice but to stand and fight. And sometimes God will allow you to be backed into a corner in a situation where you have no choice but to say, enough is enough, no more. Not a mass. Look at your neighbor and say, not a mass. Sometimes you have to switch the language just so that you can get the meaning across. <laughs> I'm not sure if he did it because he had to. I'm not sure if he said it because he needed to or he wanted to or if it just was a knee-jerk reaction. I believe Ahab said it because he just couldn't give any more to the enemy attack. How many people have gotten to that point recently? You ought to praise him if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> then, after he drew the line in the sand, after you have drawn the line in the sand to say, I'm not giving any more to whatever this thing is that I'm facing that's been draining me. I'm not giving any more. After the fear subsides, you have a moment of clarity. And you don't know how, but you know that the God that you thought was only the God of the hills has come down into the valley of whatever it is that you're facing and you realize that somehow, some way, you're still going to have the victory and it is today. <laughs> Immediately after Ahab sent message to Ben-Hadid and said, I've given you, the, I agreed to give you my, my wives, my, my children, my gold, my silver. I agreed to give you everything. But this, this last thing I cannot do. Ben-Hadid was so 
incensed, he sent a message back to Ahab and said, you know what? I swear that when we're done with you, there will be nothing left of you and your soldiers except for less than a handful of dust. Remember, Hadid had 127,000 soldiers. Ahab had seven. But you know what Ahab said? After he'd gotten his clarity, after he'd drawn a line in the sand, after he said, come with me, after it doesn't even matter, after I know that whatever God wants to be the outcome, it will be, he sent a message back and said, the one that puts on the armor shouldn't boast like the one that has taken off the armor. In other words, we're only in the beginning of the fight. You shouldn't boast like you've already won the victory. Maybe that's what you ought to tell the enemy the next time he torments you about your situation. The next time the enemy speaks fear or doubt in your mind about a healing or the need for a financial blessing or the need for a career change or the need for a miracle with your children or your house or your spouse or your dog or your cat or your next door neighbor, whatever it is that you're facing that seems so impossible, by the faith of the God that is in you, you sit and you stare that thing down and you tell yourself, I, by the power of God, am more than a conqueror. Amen. So certainly I have the victory in this. Amen. Nothing is impossible with God. And with God, all things are possible. God, you said if I had seed, faith the size of a mustard seed, I can speak to a mountain and have it removed, but not only removed, cast into the sea. Amen. So really, God, if I believe you and I stand on it, I can not only have the victory, but I can change the whole scenery. Maybe he's not just a God of the hills. Immediately, or suddenly, in verse 15, I'm sorry, verse 13, suddenly a prophet approached King Ahab and said, Thus saith the Lord, have you seen the great multitude? Have you seen the fact that there's 127,000 soldiers? Have you seen the fact that it's 127,000 reasons in the natural why your situation shouldn't be victorious? Have you heard the 127 thoughts in your head produced by the enemy about why you can't get healed or blessed or delivered or elevated or be prosperous or have kids or get rid of the kids or have a spouse or a house or whatever it is? Have you heard all of the chitter-chatter in your head from your deceptive intelligence? But the very next thing that the prophet said was, I will deliver into your hands. And today, you will know that I am the Lord. You will have the victory today over the impossible situation. How many people know that the one word from God, one word, more than conquers the 127,000 words in your head about why you can't? You ought to praise him right there. Is he a God of the hill? Sometimes we're so busy trying to see the outcome and figure it out and how are we going to do it and how, we, how can we do it? When really what God wants you to do is stop looking for him in the hills and get on your knees and come to him in humility like a little child, sincerely, and be honest. God, I don't know what to do. I need you. Please help. And then ask him. Show me, like I'm six years old. Break it down, God, step by step. I don't want to miss a morsel. I need you to hold my hand and carry me step by step through the numbers so not only do I have the victory in this area, but the victory is permanent. And not only do I have a permanent victory, I want you to elevate me to a place of being happy. Amen. Happy. Amen. 
I don't want a victory where I have battle scars and I lost an arm and a leg. I don't want to have a victory to where I'm limping with one eye for the rest of my life. I don't, I don't want to look like I've been in a war, but I want to win the war. How many people know? God, you said that with you, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. That means that I don't have to get in the battle. I turn it over to you. Show me how, God. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. The enemy tries to rob you of your joy. He wants to take the thrill out of serving God. And what I'm saying to you is if you can get into the place of seeking him for the joy, the thrill, not just loving him, but being in love with him. And if you don't know how, ask him how. Ask him. You know, you will do a lot more for somebody that you're in love with than somebody that you just love. Stop and think about it. You can love your parents dearly. But if your parents ask you to get up in the middle of the night and drive to the, I don't know, to the beach, just to walk on the beach, you probably wouldn't do it. But if you remember, some of you, some of you had to think way back, but if you remember how you felt the first time or the best time that you were really in love, in love, that crazy love where you wanted to just be with the spouse all the time. If they went into the bathroom to brush their teeth, you were at the door talking to them. <laughs> that type of love. <clears throat> and that doesn't always work out. <laughs> so if I could feel like that about somebody who I wasn't even really matched up to, how, why can't I feel that way about you, Lord? Or even if I can't wrap my head around feeling like that about you, show me how to feel like that about life and the situations you put me in. Paul said, I've been a base and I've been a bound. And no matter what, I find, what, what situation I find myself in, I am contented. So if it looks impossible, I'm good. Because I know enough about him. I love him enough. I trust him enough to know that he's going to fix it. If I'm in a situation where I'm really happy and prosperous on the outside, I'm still good because I know enough to not get so puffed up with myself until I stumble. So no matter what, God, what you're saying is I can reach a place in you to not only where I'm content, but I'm happy. I'm thrilled to serve you. And then I can see the wisdom in what you're showing me. So I'm not just looking toward the hills. I'm not just looking for the God that's far off. I'm looking for the God that's close up. Matter of fact, he's so close up, he's in me. He's so far in me, I have to look in the mirror to see him. Oh, you ought to praise him. Is he just a God of the hills? I'm closing in just a minute. Just a minute. The funny thing to me is God said through his prophet to King Ahab that today you're going to have the victory. Today you're going to win the situation over your 127,000 reasons why you should lose. Today you have the victory. Our mindsets will, will make us think the more impossible the odds, the, the longer it's going to take to overcome, when often God will do just the opposite. The crazier it looks, the swifter he will move sometimes. With one move, he loves that. One, one, one breath. He can change the whole thing. He loves it. He loves it. But not only does he love doing it, he loves doing it through you. Because he was talking to Ahab through his prophet, and he said, you're going to have the victory today. And then Ahab said, well, how are you going to do it? Who are you sending? He said, you. <laughs> Oftentimes, we think our situation is so impossible that we can't do it because we think that it has to be something outside ourselves. That's what the whole message is about. We think that we can't do it because we know that God has to do it, but we think God is a far off God. We think that God is over there in the hills and what he's saying to you on this morning, yes, he's a God of the hills, but he's a God of the valley. He's a God of the heaven. He's a God of the earth. He's a God of everybody, but he's your God inside you too. And it doesn't matter what's going on, whether it's on the outside, whether it's on the inside, whether it's black, white, blue, gray, big, small, medium size, whatever it is. If 
you trust him. And you love him. He not only can fix it, and not only will fix it, but what he's saying to you is he's elevating you to a place where he will fix it through you. You ought to praise him right there. There were 7,000 of Ahab's soldiers. 7,000. In verse 23, the servants of king of Syria went, uh, went to, said to him, they were talking about how they were going to defeat Ahab. And what they said was, their God is the God of the hills. So therefore, we're stronger than they are if we just simply get them in the valley. If we get them in the plain, if we get them on the flatland, we can win. To get to the end of the story, the reason that that was said was to invoke the mighty power of God. They took their soldiers to the flatlands, and in one day, King Ahab's 7,000 soldiers defeated 100,000 of King Ben-Hadid's soldiers. 100,000. One day. The other 27,000 fled, and as they ran away, a great wall fell on top of them. So the other 27,000 soldiers were also killed in one move. So in one day, all 127,000 forces, all 127,000 reasons, everything that would have come against King Ahab to receive the victory was completely and utterly wiped out. He drew a line in the sand, said no more, trusted God, and watched the impossible victory turn into something that was a sweatless miracle. So I say to you on this morning, whatever the greatest odds are that you're facing, this may be one of the most impossible miracles you're believing God for right now. But just as he did it for King Ahab, he certainly can do it for you. Amen? Come on, praise him. Let's get one more.